come. Yes, we can. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. What the fuck is wrong with you? Well, welcome, everybody. It's the Monday edition of What the Franklin. I hope everything is working here. I'm going to check. I had a little bit of a, well, it's Monday, man, right? You know, there we go. Yeah, we're all having good. Um, lots to talk about today. The, the big question that I want to get to today, and it's it's pretty basic, and, and that question is, should it be against the law to be a racist? And I say that, well, with there, with there's obviously there's a lot to talk about. We're going to get to all the all the regular characters from Steve Bannon to Kyle Rittenhouse and and others moving forward. Jenna Ellis, uh, who was one of Trump's attorneys, who came out with some horrible things about that Club Q shooting. Um, it's been a long weekend. I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving, and it's good to have you back. I um, it's great doing this again. You know, I uh, just kind of to set it all up for you. I um, I left KGO Radio uh, in December of 2021. So actually, it's December 1st, coming right up. It's almost a year after 27 years of five days a week, three to four hours a day of blah, 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 me just pontificating. Um, learned a little bit over those years. Uh, mostly what I've learned, though, is to listen. It's not so much about talking. And uh, I have. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a weird journey. And I really appreciate the people that continue to be interested in anything I might have to say. But for the most part, I'm, I'm listening now. And... <sighs> Yeah, the whole idea of, of what people say and freedom of speech, I'll give you a good example. In Germany, it's against the law to deny the Holocaust. Now, while that seems like a great idea, considering people like this guy, Nick Fuentes, who you probably read a little bit about, um, for the record, if you don't know Fuentes, he is a, uh, a, a well avowed anti-Semite and racist. He's the one that had dinner over the weekend with Trump and Kanye. And um, and then Trump says, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who he was. You know, um, why is he so dangerous? He's unabashedly anti-Semitic. L- listen to this. But I would say that the Jews had better start being nice to people like us. Because what comes out of this is going to be a lot uglier and a lot worse for them than anything that's being said on this show or has been said on this show. In spite of the fact that I have been bullied by the Jews and I have been oppressed and slandered and lied about and attacked by the Jews, I have been completely precise for the most part. I'm not a violent person, but you, somebody says that to your face, you know, it's, um, um, I grew up in, in Catholic schools, but we also were really close to the Jewish community in Alexandria, Virginia, where I grew up right across the river from DC. And, um, and I, I went out with a lot of Jewish girls as a kid growing up. I was the blonde haired, blue eyed, uh, uh, candy they weren't supposed to have, but I always got along well with, with their parents. And I, I always felt I could convince anybody that I was a good guy. I look at this today and I look at these white supremacists and they all look like me. They all look just like me. It's frightening. All right, so there's a lot of questions, a lot of stuff to get to. Um, I want to remind you that tomorrow we have uh, William Sweet on from OSHA, and he's going to lay out some amazing and frightening statistics about climate change, stuff that is a, it takes a little bit of time to unfold and to navigate, but it's really important we understand just where we are with that. Um, Malcolm Nance was supposed to be on today's show. Malcolm had, um, we had a, a bit of a, a problem. And so I'm not going to be back on. We're shooting Thursday. Um, and then on fr- yeah, you know, Friday, I'm thinking of doing a, um, a panel of comedians to talk about comedy. Um, although that's just sounds boring as hell, doesn't it? Who wants to talk about comedy? You know, the old saying is comedy is like dissecting a frog. You kill them both in the process. So, but I mean, some really funny people uh, that, that, um, that I've known a long time that, you probably know as well, and maybe try to get to the bottom of some of this, this, um, this woke attack for what that is. All right. Um, 
there's a lot too to come up and to get a little bit later on in the show today. We're going to talk to Natalie Boyle from uh, she's a part of an advocacy group for helping families get child care. Seventy five percent of Americans spend more than 10 percent of their salary on child care. And um, I mean, that's tough when you start thinking about it. that's after taxes, of course. And the, the tax, uh, we, well, and we, by the way, this whole show is brought to us by Moskowitz LLP tax attorneys. Uh, Steve Moskowitz, great guy, just a, an, an amazing um, firm. And they'll walk you through anything, any kind of tax situation you have. And since there's attorneys, you can tell them anything, you know, whether, whatever's gone down and they have your back. And I'm not saying accountants don't, but an accountant can be called before a judge and a tax attorney, you have attorney client privilege. So it's all good stuff. All right. Um, speaking of an attorneys here, I'm going to try to locate my first guest here. Uh, Royal Oaks, a former ABC News legal correspondent, and he might be a current Royal. Are you there? <laughs> that doesn't look like Royal. I don't know what's here. up. Can you hear me he's, okay, uh, he's trying to find us and see how he can get in. He goes, all right, Royal, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. Shoot. I hope you can somehow get in with us. Uh, Royal is an old friend. We were going to talk a little bit about um, Trump and where all this is headed. Um, all I can tell you, Royal, is to try again on this because we can't hear you. We can't see you. So give it another shot, will you, please? Thank you. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, hopefully he'll be right back with us here. You can also, if you're watching this at uh, YouTube, hopefully at YouTube, you can go to whatthefranklin.com, which takes you right to the YouTube channel so you can watch this anytime you want. And of course, you're always welcome to comment. We have a comment bar over here to the right, and I can read comments on the air. And I'd love to hear that. Um, and it's, it's always nice to hear people say good things. Let's talk a little bit, though, about this whole concept of, of race and uh, anti-Semitism and try to get to the bottom of this, this question. We have hate crimes now. So in other words, if you commit a crime against somebody and your actions were based on that person's skin color, sexual orientation, uh, ethnicity, uh, religion. There, there's a few others too in there. Um, I don't know if it applies to people who are physically disabled. I know it doesn't apply to people that are overweight and that's a whole nother thing. But I do wonder, is a hate crime the first step to trying to outlaw just being a sh bad person? Um, we know these people, we've seen them, we hear them. They say things to us all the time that are horrible. Um, uh, Royal, I don't know. I uh, Again, I apologize. Royal Oaks is trying to join us here, Royal. You're going to have to. Um, um, oh, <laughs> you can't join us on a Safari browser. So if you're on a Safari browser, it has to be a Chrome browser. And that's part of the process. And that might be it. So, again, we'll wait for that. Coming up a little bit later on too, Washington Post's Philip Bump is going to talk about his new book about baby boomers guilty and also talk about proud boys attack on lgbt um i mentioned earlier uh, you know just the the horrible nature of people sometimes um and should it be illegal to be a racist i don't think so but there's a lot of that out there now i just played you that nick fuentes um and his his comments uh, did you? I don't know if you saw this guy. This is this Nazi that was at the uh, at a at a local airport. And uh, let me see if I can get this whole thing out. Do I have the whole thing? Do we have that whole deal? Let's see what we got here. No, okay, that's after he got around. This is him uh, screaming in the airport. Yelling Sieg Heil and race war. He was arrested. I want you to look at this closely. You notice there's no knees on his neck? No guns pointed at him? Yeah. Um, imagine if that guy was black, screaming Black Lives Matter or, or Antifa. <sighs> Again, you know, I don't know what goes through people's minds to act like that and to, to speak towards others. Um, you, you look at people like Tucker Carlson, whom I knew in the early 90s and was a pretty normal person. Same with Sean Hannity. And I was on his show in, God, I don't want to say the early 90s in New York. I don't have the date off the top of my head. I was, um, But these were different people. And 
I don't know if it's money. I don't know what it was that changed them. Um, as you look at these, you look at these stories and listen to these people. I mentioned this before. This is Jen Ellis. She was an attorney. Uh, is an attorney. Was hired by um, the Trump campaign, and uh, and she worked for Trump for a while, and and then she was fired after a short period of time. She was totally incapable. But again, she's still in Republican circles and and says things like this about the Club Q shooting, where 25 people were shot and five were killed by a guy who, if you saw the interview with his father, his father was like, uh, uh, for, uh, I could play it for you. I'm not going to play it for you. His father came out and said that, the, um, that uh, he was glad that his son wasn't gay. When he heard he was shot these people up at a, at a gay club, his first thought was, oh, my God, he's gay. And then he found out, oh, no, he's not. This is the world. This is Jenna Ellis. Listen to this. The five people who were killed in the nightclub that night, there is no evidence at all that they were Christians. And so assuming right. that they were not, that they had not accepted the truth of the gospel of Christ and affirmed Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life, they are now reaping the consequences of having eternal damnation. And that is far, far greater. And we should be having that conversation instead yes. of just the tragedy of what happened to the body. We need to be talking about what happened to the soul and the fact that they are now in eternal separation from our Lord yes. and Savior, Jesus Christ. The hell is wrong? You know, I went to Catholic schools for 12 years. I never heard any shit like that. That's just crazy shit. And I don't know who teaches that. I don't know what kind of religions teach that, but that wasn't the Catholic school that I grew up in. It was about acceptance. So we didn't talk a lot about gay people. I didn't give you that. Uh, but the school was, uh, you know, a third Hispanic, a third black, a third white. Uh, and, and I think that the, the most Christians in this country uh, don't espouse this kind of hate and this kind of idiocy, but it is, it's fun. It's, you know, if you look at the evangelicals in South Carolina that are supporting Herschel Walker or the evangelicals that supported Trump, and some continue to do so, they're insane, but you've seen them. And you, you have to you ask yourself these questions about like um, what part is that religion go down that road? All right. So let's go back to the first question. Should it be illegal to say the N word in the street? Whether you're white or black, you can't because you can't just say that black people can say it and white people can't. Now, granted. These things solve themselves sometimes when a white person says it in front of a, a large group of black people as I would, they respond accordingly. If somebody throws that kind of pejorative or invective at you, whether you're an African-American or you're Hispanic or you're gay or you're, I mean, you know, that guy at, at the Q club that um, I, I'm not, I'm not even going to say his name. He got the shit kicked out of him by uh, many of these people that were there. And, um, and, you know, again, the idea that just because <laughs> you're gay that you can't fight for yourself is, is not accurate. There are, um, there are a lot of examples of that. But again, I get back to the point. I don't know. I, you guys are more than welcome to comment on this. And let me just see if we have anybody in here. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is probably a good way. This, you know, Ricky says they're not a good Christian. I don't know what that means. Um, but, you know, I mean, and this is another one again, you know, let's talk about your soul, Jenna. Uh, the hate the hate comes from, um, uh, I think, a play, and it started, the thing that Trump allowed, he allowed people of, quote unquote, faith to um, say, well, we're going to do this in order to get that. We'll embrace this guy to stop abortion. And of course, it's a joke. You don't stop abortion. I mean, there could be a federal law and there would still be abortion. I had a friend before Roe v. Wade, when we were little kids and his older brother was 14, and got a girl pregnant, and they took her to Canada to get an abortion, and they botched it. Um, I guess, yeah, let's get, let's get to some of your calls here. And again, I apologize to Royal Oaks for not being able to get online. Royal, I, I don't know why this is not working for you. Um, we will continue to keep an eye on this and see if we can get you in. If we can't today, we'll get him back. Royal Oaks is a former ABC News legal correspondent and um, great guy, smart guy. And I mean, some of the questions we wanted to talk about today and we can continue that but the whole concept of whether or not um we should indict and prosecute trump or does that play into the hands of the 30 some million people 
40. Oh, wait, oh, good. I think we got him here. I think we do. Do we have you now, finally? I think you got me. Can you hear me? Uh, I can kind of hear you. You can turn your volume up a little bit. That'd be great. Yeah, I'm not All sure. All right. I'm this technology is some tough stuff, isn't it? Volume. Now, you sound better now. Say good, good. Good. Good to have here. Um, so, obviously, we were talking about this earlier. Um, let me ask you a question. Let's go back a little bit to the first hate crimes, okay, the federal hate crimes. Uh, the idea that somebody commits a crime, um, it, we used to just judge the, the sentencing and everything on the crime itself and not who the crime was directed toward, right? Um, I, I don't know where that came. Would you know when the first hate crimes were in the 80s? Was that, that does it go way that, that far back, do you know? Yeah, I think it does go back to, to the 80s. And, and I think it was a function of our frustration with the fact that some people are just pure evil. But the difficulty is you raise a really good question, Chip. And by the way, it's a pleasure to be working with you again. Good to uh, see you, buddy. We've worked together for years and uh, there's nobody better than you. So I'm always honored to be Thanks. asked by you to be on the show. But I mean, is it against the law to be racist? Well, I mean, you know, the Kanye West controversy makes everybody think about this. Certainly it is not illegal to be racist. You can sit in your bedroom watching Gilligan's Island and you can be as racist as you want. And it's OK. You're a bad person, but you're not violating the law. The thing is, you can't lynch somebody because you're a racist. You can't deny them a job because you're you a racist. You can't do any of those things, even if you are, are not a racist. Well, right. right. But hate crimes, as you know, will make it even longer. If you lynch somebody and uh, it's because of a racist, of course, by definition, you're going to spend more years in prison. If you deny a job uh, illegally, if you, if you uh, assault somebody you might get five years if there's no racist motivation. You might get 10 years if there is a racist motivation. So that's where the crunch comes, where the rubber meets the road. The tough question is, what if your racism uh, comes out not as a physical assault, but a statement, as you said a minute ago, uh, the use of the N-word, hate speech? It's a, it's a big debate because some people don't even believe in hate uh, uh, crimes. Uh, they don't think it's worth a few more years in jail if you hit somebody because you're a racist. Some folks don't even think uh, don't think that there should be hate speech on the books because it's too much like thought police. And here, here's well, is there hate speech. I mean, can I walk down the street saying the N word? Uh, some communities have laws that purport to ban hate speech. Um, but that's, you can't. That's impossible. How can right. you do those, that? those laws generally are going to fail. Uh, there are laws like disturbing the peace. There are laws like inciting to riot. And that may be a real thing. You, you can't say a bunch of words, even if they're not obscene, uh, and, and cause people to riot. But where I was going to go back to was the 1970s when the ACLU stood with the Nazis who wanted to march in Skokie, Skokie yeah. a Jewish community in Illinois. And a lot of people were stunned that this organization would support these monstrous people who want to march in a community where many Holocaust survivors still lived because this was the 1970s and their family members and so on. But the ACLU said, no, we, the only way the First Amendment has any power is if we embrace the concept that the worst of the worst should be free to express themselves. And so for that reason, I, I think you can, in general, say whatever you want. Uh, there was a guy years ago, Chip, who went to court and he thought it would be clever to wear a T-shirt that said F the draft. Only he spelled out the full F word. Mm. And the U.S. Supreme Court went all the way up and they said, you know what? He can do that. Because the First Amendment, even if you're going to court and everybody's acting fancy and the judge is in the black robe and the gavel looking down at you, you can still express yourself in that way. And so in general, you can. Maybe not everybody's going to like this concept, but in general, the First Amendment is so strong, is so muscular. It's got to protect. If we don't help people uh, when they're really being despicable, then how do you how do you it, draw the line? And it's important you, you, what you just said is that my boss can still fire me. I'm, that doesn't protect the First Amendment doesn't protect me from getting fired. It yeah, that's because the First me. Amendment only uh, governs actions by the government, not right. by private people. And it was intended, Madison wrote it, so people could criticize the government. That was the whole idea is that you should be able. Yeah, I mean, other than the voting box, you should be able to have a voice against your right. government, you know, right when you disagree with it. Um, but I, I go back. To, I mean, it seems to me we're becoming uh, and you've seen it with comedians which I have a, you know, I mean, a lot of empathy for. I disagree with 
the approach that Dave Chappelle has uh, on, um, you know, talking about trans or, or Jews. Um, but I think he has every right in the world to do it, you know, and, and I think in some ways he probably does it just so I'm talking about him and others are talking about him. Um, but I do think that we're getting closer and closer to states passing laws where I can't say the F word or the S word in public. Um, there was a time when you could, we arrested people for that. You were McCall, right? We called it public obscenity or right, right. obscenity laws. And yeah. of course the irony is we're actually going the other way in the sense that uh, when you and I were growing up um, and we would watch, I love Lucy reruns. You're never going to see Lucy and Ricky in bed together. They had the rule. Sure. Separate beds. Dick Van Dyke and, either. Remember they had separate yeah. beds. Yeah. Rob Petrie. Right. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that you have to have, you know, one. By the way, can I just say this? Dick Van Dyke's name is dirtier than that show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes, anyway. so nowadays, though, look at where we are today. I mean, you can drop just about any bomb you want on a, a podcast, uh, uh, on HBO. You turn on Bill Maher, and there are absolutely no holds barred when it comes to that. But, you know, to me, the intriguing debate, in addition to the debate over, okay, you've got hate crimes. You give him more time because uh, the crime was motivated by the race. Hate speech. Nobody got hit but it was horribly despicable speech and it really horribly offended people. Now we come to the question of campus speakers. If you're Ann Coulter or you're Tucker Carlson and you want to speak on uh, the campus of UC Berkeley because the Berkeley Republicans invited you, ain't going to happen. Wouldn't be prudent. And you and I know why. They would tear the place down. And there is a sense in this country among some people on the progressive side that some speech is so bad yeah. We'll think Tucker Carlson. It is equivalent to violence, and therefore it justifies violence in return because it has such devastating impacts on people. Now, that's a healthy debate to have. I'm not saying who's right or who's wrong. I'm just saying the fact is you and I know Tucker and Ann ain't going to be going to Berkeley anytime soon. All right. So um, we're talking to Royal Oaks. What's your name of your podcast? I'm sorry. Oh, it's called Too Many Lawyers. And my son, Connor, and I, he's also a lawyer. Uh, do too many lawyers every week. We try to dissect uh, the uh, the legal stories in the news. Good. Okay. Too many lawyers. Again, Royal Oaks. Um, and I, I, by the way, this is brought to you by Moskowitz LLP, uh, 800 uh, tax deal. Steve and his firm, amazing attorneys. Any question you have, they'll have the answer for it. Good people. They helped me out and they've, and they've helped a lot of my friends out, musicians that hadn't filed for years. Great people. Again, it's 800 tax deal. Um, one of the things, though, that worries me is um, you remember Larry Flint versus uh, um, I think what state it was a state, but it was a federal case. Um, he had parodied Jerry Falwell. He had a cartoon of Jerry Falwell having sex with his mother in an outhouse. Right. And it went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled he had that right to do it. Uh, there's now new cases coming before the Supreme Court about parody and about um, the ability of, of people like myself and others on Twitter to mock uh, uh, not and it, not even thinly veiled. It's pretty obvious. It's parody that this is not real, but we're mocking them. And it seems possible with the six the six three conservative court, which is ironic that I call them conservative, that they'd want to take away a fundamental right, um, but an individual right. But if they do, then we're into a whole nother area, uh, Royal. We're into an area where the um, the governments, local governments, and or uh, any any type of uh, law enforcement could stop somebody on the street or arrest somebody in front of their computer like I am right now for saying things that parodied um, uh, positions or uh, thoughts or actions of well-known uh, well known people. Uh, that's the key to this. And let me just throw that out real quick. When I was on the radio every day for 27 years, the thing was, if somebody came on the air and said that, you know, from Jimmy Carter to, uh, uh, to George Bush was an a-hole, right? Um, I, I, you know, you, you could let it go or they could come out and they say, I think that uh, Bill Clinton is a pedophile, right? Bill Clinton's a public figure. But if, if they said that about my next door neighbor, right, um, then I would have to drop it because that person couldn't protect themselves. And that's that's the key, you know. Well, that's right. That is an important factor in terms of, of self-protection. But but I think the bigger issue is. I mean, the arc of history, you can't deny the, the progress. I mean, I mentioned the I Love Lucy and now what Bill Maher can say, but it's in everything. I mean, you remember the, the Loving case in the 60s? We used to have interracial marriage bans. We used to have laws that said you can only do certain sex acts. Yeah. Uh, and now gay marriage, I mean, 
this has been incredible progress. So I think for people to try but, to. But you and I both backwards. know this court could turn that over. Well, they, they could. Back. They could. But I think at the end of the day, I think the court is going to be reluctant to do something that is so egregiously in violation of common sense and what most people want. Now, you could say, well, Royal, what about Dobbs case? You know, they threw out the right to abortion. But there's been a healthy debate for decades about that. And so I, I don't think that the Supreme Court, the majority that struck down uh, Roe versus Wade, I don't think that they thought that there would be pitchforks and torches advancing on the Supreme Court. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they feel like they, they're just totally empowered and can do anything they want. But I think I'm maybe more optimistic than you. I think that judges in general, including the Supreme Court, realize that there is this arc of history and you know, they're not going to be going back to Dred Scott. They're not going to be going back to Plessy versus Ferguson. And I think in terms of parody, I mean, good grief. I mean, we've made such progress from you know, Lenny Bruce and George Carlin literally going to jail for saying naughty words that today, you know, fourth graders toss off without any uh, recrimination. Let me just say this, Royal. Tell me what channel is showing All in the Family. They don't put it on television anymore. The reruns. Oh, is that right? It. Because I know a lot of uh, 60s and 70s shows are on uh, Me TV and other uh, cable yeah, outlets. I mean, but the, you, you and I both know why. I mean, family? Yeah. No, I, I think that, uh, look, first of all, you have a Supreme Court justice whose wife is out saying the election was stolen. And, uh, and then you have Thomas, who has actually um, uh, appeared with some of these groups that are, are not just subversive, but have have. You know, him and his wife, he and his wife. Um, and it's worrisome on, on a whole lot of levels. Amy Coney Barrett should be recusing herself from an LGBT case. She's been part of a group that says that homosexuality is a sin before God. And she's spoken that in public. So we have, I'm a lot more worried than you are. You think, I think, I don't think, I think we've, this idea of progress is something that if you look you know, selectively, you go, okay, we are progressing. But we're also now in, in an area where, you know, nuance is damn near dead. That you try to have a conversation with somebody that has to last more than 60 seconds and, uh, and they start yelling at you. You know, I, I, I'm not as optimistic on that, on that part. You know, I think that- You're right, civility is, has taken a real big hard hit. Uh, pol everybody knows what's happened to our society in terms of polarization, certainly caused by Trump in the estimation of most people. Uh, you, you raise an interest. No, no, Trump was, Trump was a catalyst. It was there. He was the spark and the gasoline. I mean, th that hatred. Oh, come on. You know, it was all. Well, no, I, I'm just trying to think of a metaphor where it would be more substantial than just a spark. I mean, like a Molotov cocktail, I think is what Trump was. Yeah, and I mean. What blew yeah. stuff up. But you look now and you, with, with, you know, Trump's ascent seemingly abated or, or maybe possibly over. And you look at the others that, that have stood. I played. Uh, Jenna Ellis uh, earlier on talking about how these uh, she was a former Trump attorney. Uh, but you listen to people like, uh, oh, here you go. I mean, I got like um, uh, here you go. This is again talking about the shootings. And this is this is Tucker Carlson's take on why it happened. Anderson Lee Aldrich committed mass murder because you complained about the sexualizing of children, sexually mutilating kids, sexually mutilating children, the sexual mutilation of children. So this is he's referring to uh, gay people. OK, um, and, and that gay people are the reason why uh, this guy went in, uh, in, into a, a gay bar and shot 25 people, killing five. I mean, and there's no pushback, not real pushback. You know, he's a star on Fox. And when he says these things, it motivates other people. Now, I don't want to stop him. I don't want to legally stop him from saying it. Right. But you see where we are, right? I mean, it's 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 mind numbing. Yeah, no. And, and, and a lot of people say that this gives some credence to the notion that I described a few minutes ago uh, about the UC Berkeley students who take the position that, you know what, some speech is so bad that it actually rises to, to the level of violence. You know, you, you raised an interesting question, Chip, a couple of minutes ago about Clarence Thomas. And I know that's actually uh, front and center on, on the plate. And, and actually, my son Connor and I are going to be talking about it during our next episode of Too Many Lawyers. And that is... Why I love how you got that in. That was good. Well, here's the deal. Why shouldn't Clarence Thomas recuse himself when his wife, Jenny, is an ultimate activist when it comes to the very because issue? Because there's nothing that can force them to, Royal. Well, that's, that's a separate issue. And that's a very interesting issue, too. If you're a trial court judge or appellate court judge, there are rules. And you can be kicked off of a court 
uh, and, and be told that's it. If you're on the U.S. Supreme Court, nobody gets to boss you around and your your colleagues could pressure you. But there's no there's no actual way to get rid of them. But here's here's the issue that I wanted to raise about Clarence Thomas. If you're a judge and you're sitting there and you and you look at the plaintiff and the defendant and say, hey, cousin Bert, you're the plaintiff. Uh, you're out of there, okay? If it's your stock that's that's at issue, if you have a personal interest, or if your wife has a personal interest, you have to recuse yourself. Now we look to Jenny Thomas. She's an activist. She leads groups, and she says, "Stop the steal." She's totally in there with Trump. Twenty-nine texts to the uh, the uh, the guy who was the chief of staff for Donald Trump. But my question is, if she merely has a very strong rooting interest. Does that mean that Clarence Thomas has to step aside, even though, you know, it looks bad? And, and the analogy I would make is, what if Justice Sotomayor's husband was a really big advocate of pro-choice? What if he was president of groups and he marches and so on, but he's not technically a party to a suit. He isn't going to get money if one suit wins or loses. I don't think many people would say, you know what, Mr. Sotomayor, uh, your wife has to recuse herself. From Here's all a difference, this. Royal. The difference is he was supporting the law. Right. Pro-choice is still the law. Oh, in, you're right. You know, I mean, the federal yeah, law. Some people would say that courts are free yeah. to reverse an old precedent. You can argue it's a really bad idea, as I agree. It is a bad idea to dump Roe versus Wade. But I, I think the, the bottom line is that we try to bend over backwards to promote free speech and to stop and to not punish people for expressing themselves in, in a full way. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, they're words and words are powerful. I'm, you know, I've done stand up my whole since 1979 and, I, and I've, I've seen, you know, the, the power of it. I've always felt um, a certain confidence in life because I could stand in front of 200 people and make them laugh. I knew how to do it. I mean, it's quite and, a guess. Knew, well, I mean, it was like, you know, it was it was it was work and you figure it out um, for great writers that, you know, I mean, when you read somebody that is a. Um, uh, it, it does that really well. I'm trying to think of somebody that on both sides, George Will is a great writer, as is, um, uh, I mean, you know, it's funny when I think about like, um, again, trying to protect a concept or a, 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 um, a, a law, you know, uh, words are all we have. Right. And right. so when we start talking about taking some words out of the language because they offend certain people, that's you know, like I mentioned at the start of this segment, Germany, you put you in jail if you say the Holocaust uh, was a uh, fake. Well, I don't think you're exactly right. And the key there, Chip, is that you never know who's going to be in charge. You never know if you're going to have no, a Trump. No. Yep. You never know if you're going to have a Newt Gingrich as Speaker of the House. And if you have the the possibility of squelching rights, and even though it really would be satisfying to you to 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 you know, stop somebody like Kanye West somehow. You have to have in the back of your mind, you know, in four or eight years, the bad guys are going to be running the show and they're going to be using- You're assuming that adults are running this whole thing. And that's a problem. Well, again, it's Too Many Lawyers is the podcast. Uh, Royal Oaks is with us, a former ABC News legal correspondent. Thank you, my friend. All right. My pleasure, Chip. See you soon, buddy. Bye-bye. Yeah, that's- I spoke earlier of, of great writers. Our next guest is one of them. Uh, you can see his work in the Washington Post. Uh, he has a new book out called The Aftermath, which is it's about us boomers out here. I don't think he counts himself as one. Philip Bump joins us here on uh, What the Franklin. Uh, Philip, um, first of all, congratulations on the new book. Thanks. It's, it's actually out in January. So I know. I, but that's I what I mean. It's been done. You know. Yeah, it's, I, I want to hear more about it in, in a second. Sure. Um, and Because I know how hard it is to write uh, a your column and do all the research and, and actually okay. write a book too, and not have your wife hit you over the head with a, 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 a something solid. Um, so let me ask you this: the um, you wrote a piece the other day about the Proud Boys and the, um, the their attention on LGBT, and uh, you know we've seen the attacks recently, and 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 seen the um, I mean, not just against gays, but against uh, if you, Nick Fuentes and others talking about anti, the anti-Semitic attacks. Mm-hmm. And then we've heard, you know, again, the border narrative is often really just thinly disguised as an attack on Hispanics. Um, what makes this unique in this this group of Proud Boys? First of all, how many Proud Boys are there and how well organized are they? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure that even federal authorities know that with uh, to, to any concrete extent. I mean, the Proud Boys is sort of a, uh, it is somewhat ad hoc. I mean, there are chapters to which one can belong, but it's also the case that it's sort of a, a an identity, if you will, uh, that people can sort of uh, assign themselves as being members of the Proud Boys or advocate for Proud Boys positions uh, in a way that isn't necessarily formal. So, so it's not really clear. It is clear, though, that the Proud Boys still exist uh, as a, an organization to some extent, and that they're participating in activities that reflect uh, their far-right ideology. Uh, and that includes, uh, particularly over the, the course of this year and the latter half of this year, uh, a focus on events at which uh, LGBTQ issues are uh, present or imputed. They, they're showing up at a lot of uh, drag events, for example, sort of reflecting this far-right rhetoric about the, the purported dangers uh, of drag shows. Uh, and it really shows that they they are certainly unchastened uh, by the Capitol riot, uh, and they still exist as a force of uh, deliberate latent uh, potential for violence uh, on the on the right side of the political spectrum. Do they have any association or contact with Oath Keepers, or are these two entirely separate groups? <laughs> They're separate groups, and in fact, they were somewhat antagonistic toward each other. The fact that the leaders of the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys met on January 5th in a parking garage, uh, January 5th, 2021, right before the Capitol riot, was seen as some, somewhat remarkable uh, because Stuart Rhodes, the head of the Oath Keepers, saw the Proud Boys totally justifiably as a bunch of thugs and goons, uh, whereas the Oath Keepers tended to be people who were former members of law enforcement or the military. Uh, and so he saw themselves as sort of professional and real and the Proud Boys as, as thugs, uh, which, you know, again, is not inaccurate. Um, I, I'm not sure the extent of any relationship that might exist at this point. The former assistant director of the FBI, um, uh, Frank Fagluzzi, has told us on many occasions that he believes the FBI has uh, a, a, a paid a lot of close attention to these groups. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, again, with, the, you know, their narrative about, you know, getting America back to like a some 50s version um, <clears throat> are LGBT at the top of that list simply because they're easier to see? And I say, I say easier to see there, um, especially if you're talking about drag shows and, and, and the such. Um, or is this is this uh, do they have a, an agenda that goes across the board that, you know, again, I for lack of a better word, says trying to relive the 1950s? No, I think it's probably opportunistic. The fact that there's been this focus uh, on the right and conservative media broadly uh, about LGBTQ issues over the course of the past few months, a year and a half or so, I guess you could say. I think the Proud Boys are sort of glomming onto that as opposed to having it be at the center of her, their uh, their narrative. They 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 talk about themselves as Western chauvinists, uh, which is this. Uh, <laughs> obviously contrived way of talking about how, you know, they, they put basically Western white people at the, at the forefront of their, of their thinking uh, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with being gay or lesbian, uh, except for the fact that, as you say, there's a sort of this, this outdated I idealized sense of what it means to be white in the Western world uh, that includes being very masculine and straight and so on and so forth. And I think that, uh, you know, that's how they sort of tied into what they're about, but really it's just about, getting engaged in the sorts of things that the right is mad about. Talking to Washington Post, Philip Bump, his new book's out in January called um, In the Aftermath. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to read Malcolm Nance's book, uh, They They Want to Kill Us. Um, it was it's pretty frightening. I mean, mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't know to what extent I should take it seriously. I mean, I'm I'm one of those guys. I can walk into any room, you know, blonde haired. Well, I don't have blonde hair anymore, but <laughs> blue eyed white guy. And, um, and people say things to me and, you know, I've experienced that my whole life, uh, you know, whether it was racist or anti-Semitic or whatever. And, uh, and I wonder, you know, um, you know, watching the, I, I'm not sure if you saw this guy, but this was, to me, this is, this is the part that uh, this whole thing that, that frightens me is that people feel this free to act like this. Yeah, this is in what, Portland, is that right, Seattle? Yeah, and they arrested him. Um, but um, and I made a, a point to note that there was no knee on his neck when he was on the ground, and and, and no firearms. Um, but it, you know, I don't know if social media has given people the uh, bravado or the platform, but it seems to me that something's changed in my life. To that point, let me ask you about you. Know, here you go. Oh, he, he agrees. Let me ask you about your book. Sure. This is about boomers, right? 
Yeah, no, it, it actually gets to what you're talking about, which is what has changed in America. And one of the things that's changed in America is that the baby boom, which was a, a, a dominant force to an extent that I don't think even baby boomers recognize the, the, the extent to which boomers reshaped the country uh, and how the boomers have held political, economic and cultural power for so long. And now that's changing. You know, as as boomers die, uh, as millennials uh, who almost uh, match boomers on a one to one basis uh, by the age of 40, uh, just by virtue of the fact that the millennial generation is so large, of course, America's gotten bigger. So they make up less as a, as a percentage. Uh, but what does that change look like? What does it mean? What does it mean that the boom emerged in a moment when America had very little immigration, was very densely white? And now America broadly and boomers in particular are seeing a much more diverse America and a much more particularly among younger people, liberal America, does that hold, you know, so it's, so it's about all these changes. And you're absolutely right that the, the internet plays a big role in both giving young people a voice in conversation that they wouldn't necessarily even had 30 years ago, right? You wouldn't have had the same sort of activism. It would have been more contained. It wouldn't necessarily have been as present in the older generation's face as it is now, which I think sort of exacerbates things. But of course, the internet is also used as a, as a platform for engagement and organizing. Uh, and so we see these people, you know, the example I like to use is the Internet, to your point, is before the Internet existed, before social media existed, there were people who liked to dress up as animals. Right. But no one knew about them. No one knew what a furry was. But now they had conventions because they found each other online. Right. You know, and it's just the remarkable power of the Internet. But it also works for Nazis. Right? So you have this yeah. downside, too, um, that allows them to, to organize as well. And I think that's obviously part of what's going on. And of course, you know, the, the AI deep fake stuff, we don't know where that's going to be in 10 years, right? I mean, where I can show a picture of, of Philip Bump talking and I can have any, any kind of words coming out of your mouth, right? Sure. Um, you know, the, the idea of when I was a kid, I remember, and I've told the story a million times, I had a nun who was actually a Holocaust survivor mm -hmm. uh, when I was real little, about nine or eight or nine years old. And pointed out to me that the sun is almost nine minutes old when I see it because it yeah. takes that long for the light to get here. So I'm actually seeing the past. I went home. My mom's like, what are they teaching you at that school? But what I learned was is to that that as much as we'd like to think that truth is 100 uh, percent um, easily ascertained and that, you know, that facts are facts, as we used to say. But that was a math major. There's irrational numbers. Sure. Give me the answer to 10 divided by three. I'll wait. Right. Okay. It's so we find ourselves in this world where, you know, um, if you walk into a room two seconds after a, a fight starts and you see the second punch thrown, you, that person's the aggressor. We have a lot of issues that need nuance. And I, I brought this to Royal Oaks, our legal correspondent earlier, and we don't seem to have the ability to traverse that 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 road anymore. Nuance is hard. It means you got to listen. Um, boomers, I don't know. I mean, it's, as I grew up, I was always told in Catholic schools. You know, I mean, if I got anything out of Catholic schools, it was the power of listening. Mm. You know, um, but the the baby boomers were the. I mean, we're if we don't get immigration in, or we desperately need immigrants in this country in order to continue our economic growth. Okay. Uh, and uh, and and the boomer boom, of course, for most people that don't know, it's in reference to when the, the troops all came home from World War II and started having families. These young kids came back and they wanted to start. I don't know how accurate that is of a real description of them, but, sure. you know, um, it, that's I can go into great detail if you want, but I won't right now. I want to read the book. I'm excited about well, it. So, um, so in, uh, looking forward now, um, how did the boomers tr do in, in this transition? Um, I, I look at people that are older um, and I wonder, are they wiser? Are they part of this? Are there Trumpers in their 70s that did, before that were normal? Or is this something that was unique to 30, 40, 50 year olds? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, there are a, a few ways to approach this. The first is that most people's political ideologies are, are pretty set by the time they get to about their mid 20s. Uh, by the time they're in their 40s, they're they're basically in stone and, and they don't really change and there's been some good research about that that's obviously covered in the book um so it is the case that the baby boom being a giant generation is diverse in a lot of different ways uh, even if it's not as diverse racially it's certainly diverse economically there are a lot of people who are 
poor baby boomers. There are some extremely rich baby boomers. Uh, it is also the case that there's a lot of political diversity, of course. There are a lot of Democrats and there are a lot of Republicans. Uh, there tend to be more Republicans. The most recent data I've seen from Pew Research shows there's more Republican boomers than there are Democratic booters, boomers. And so there's a very, and since the boom is so large, there are a lot of white male Republican boomers, right, that tend to drive a lot of conversation about stuff and, and made up a significant part of Donald Trump's base. Uh, not all of it, certainly, uh, but there's definitely overlap there. Uh, and if you t if you look at this, though, and the, 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 the lens through which the book is written is really this idea that when you talk about something like make America great again, you're talking about evoking a past sense of what America was that very much overlaps with the idealized sense of what a boomer childhood was like. Right. You know, what was America like in the 1950s? The 1950s are often cited as a decade in which, you know, to which people are looking back or just been some even recent bullying that didn't make the book. Uh, but, you know, think about what doesn't happen in the 1950s, like black people couldn't vote in Alabama. Right. I mean, like it was like it's an insane time to be nostalgic for for anyone besides Rob and Laura Petrie slept in different beds. <laughs> right. right. I mean, it's sort of a, a, a lesser threat to America. But, um, you know, I mean, but the, the <laughs> fact that there is that nostalgia that exists for this period when the baby boom was growing up is absolutely inextricable from the fact that baby boomers have held power so long and are now seeing threats to that power. Those things are like. Yeah. Uh, go to the Washington Post uh, dot com and check out Philip Bump and uh, get that order in on Amazon right now. It's called In the Aftermath and uh, Philip Bump. It's with one L. And uh, good to have you here, my friend. Good. You know, it's finally, it's the first we've done a million interviews. First time ever on TV. Right. I know. It's crazy. You, 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 I, you, I had no idea you were bald. Who knew? You clean up well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get out of here. All right, buddy. Thanks, Thank man. You. Yeah, again, Philip Bump. The book is called In the Aftermath. And that is our next guest, uh, Natalie Boyle from MommiesInNeed.org. I was going to set it up, uh, Natalie. Um, I, I read an article on the New York Times from last week. Uh, we spoke last week, and it was it was kind of um, went to your issue. 75% uh, of Americans are spending 10% of their income just uh, on, on trying to you know, to have child, good child care for the kids or any kind of child care for their kids. And this is a huge problem. Um, what is the macro effect, Natalie, on our society and the fact that we're, you know, that these parents have to work? I mean, just look at the world right now. What's the macro effect? How is it affecting children moving forward and, and in that sense, our society? Well, I, I, you know, I think that's a really good point is that you have to look at it as a whole and how it's impacting things. So, um, you know, Child care was a crisis in this country before the pandemic, and then we hit the pandemic and everything got worse, right? A lot of child care operators had to close, never reopened. Um, there's essential supply and demand problems, which makes the care very, very expensive. And what we see kind of at that bigger level is what you're seeing is, number one, women leaving the workforce in droves because they can no longer have it make sense to work and um, have some have childcare for their kids. Um, you see a ton of women not coming back from maternity leave. And when we talk about staffing shortages, if you look at the um, demographics of that, you'll see that it's largely women that are out of the, the workforce now. And so it's causing workforce issues. It's causing um, poverty issues because a lot of families are making the choice to say, we, you know, uh, we can't afford child care now, but then the women get off kind of off that career wheel and then aren't able to kind of get back on and be making that that kind of good salaries that helps the family even once the kids are grown up. So that's just one piece of it. But there, there's a lot. I was a latchkey kid and I was, just, I, I was lucky I didn't get in worse trouble. I mean, it's 12 years old coming home by myself after school. But I know that's a big part of it, too, obviously. Right. The children getting in, in trouble, especially in areas where. Um, there's not a neighborhood sense. My neighbors, if they saw me doing something wrong, told my mom yeah. and, you know, and, and my mom was a wonderful mom, but she would spank me, you know, when I was eight, nine, 10 years old. Um, not, you know, it, it's hard to put that into context. I know, but child care is, it's just an odd, it's, it's a, it's a generational word. You know, when we were little, um, I don't know, you know, they say FBI says the world's safer now than it was when I was a small child, as far as violent crime goes. But it seems to me we're not really talking about overt acts. We're just talking about acts of omission. And that's the sad and scary part. Whereas, you know, somebody being with a kid, so he's not watching TV nine hours a day, you know, all, uh, I mean, what is child care, the state of child care today? If you had to give it a grade A to F. 
I mean, as a nation or in a D minus um, wow. situation, it's not good. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we I tell everybody, that, by the way, the, the, your, the, the nonprofit that you, yeah. um, you work with is mommiesinneed.org. That's correct. So yeah. mommy's in need. Um, so our, our mission is caring for kids so families can access health care. So it really surrounds um, where health care and child care meet. That's kind of the sweet spot where we um, where we take care of kids. Uh, and so uh, I started the organization in 2014. I'm a cancer survivor. And um, at the time I got diagnosed, I had 18 month old twins and I was a stay at home mom. Jeez. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you can't be a stay-at-home mom if you're in that kind of treatment. I mean, I spent a ton of time in the hospital. I had multiple surgeries. And so um, with that, I started to recognize this piece, again, of, of child care. You know, I had been one of the, the very privileged people who was able to take up, you know, to decide to be a stay-at-home parent to my ch- children. Um, and my husband made a very good living, but it still wasn't enough money for us to hire a full-time nanny. So, you know, we were filling in with family and friends and nannies when we needed them. And what we started to recognize or what I started to recognize was that, you know, as hard as my health uh, situation was and, you know, all the time I missed with my children and the emotional strain on that, I was still extremely lucky. And that was because I had that family and I had that community support. Um, And, you know, as we were talking, as you're talking about communities, I think the way that the nation is organized now is not in these small little communities that really know each other and pitch in. And there's so much mobility. People are moving all the time. And so what that means is a lot of people that don't have any support system where they live, they don't have their family there. They, you know, may not even have a really solid friend group there to help them get through these things. Um, So I started Mommies in Need uh, really just for my friend Annie, who um, got diagnosed with colon cancer, and she didn't she didn't have somebody to watch her kids, and I was better, and I was like, well, I'll just send my nanny to you, and then we'll fundraise to pay for it. And what we discovered really quickly was not only did we have enough money for Annie's care, but that constantly I was being asked, I need this for my friend, my sister, my neighbor. Um, And so that's sort of when we became an organization um, and we started looking at at much bigger solutions to, okay, how do we solve this issue of when a parent is sick, um, where do those kids go? And, um, and so that's sort of how we started. Uh, we now work with hospitals. So in addition to having our in-home program um, where we send nannies to families that are completely disabled, um, we also have a program where we uh, partner with hospitals. So we have a child care center at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, which is the safety net hospital. So it's serving mostly families who are living at 200% below poverty level. Um, and, uh, and they can drop their kids off so they can get care. It's free care from us. Uh, and we started to recognize that it's a big piece of health care access. Access. And so that's sort of our, our niche within the child care area. And you know, that's to me, though, that the part of that that I love is, I mean, you said something earlier, and that's that really gets me thinking It's like, you know, you said just sometimes you're just lucky, but that's not a real plan. Right. <laughs> you know, I hope I'm lucky. Right. And, um, and, you know, again, when you look back uh, in, in the communities, you know, we, I went to Catholic schools. And everybody knew everybody else. It was small. My high school only had 160 kids in my class, you know. Um, and I grew up in a, you know, right outside of D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia. You probably know where that is. Thank and um, and so, what's changed? You know, obviously the population has probably doubled since I was a kid, mm-hmm. and 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 obviously that really taxes any kind of social organizations. That and of course their interface with the government, which is always difficult because it's always money. Um, I saw a woman outside of a grocery store trying to get people to sign a petition about for parks and libraries. And this and this woman was giving her a hard time about what's going to raise my taxes. And I'm like, where are your kids going to go? I mean, if you can't see the value in parks and libraries, how can we convince people that this isn't just, you know, black families that don't care about their kids? I mean, because that's the narrative. Right. And, you know, it's really interesting as well is because we serve, so the population we serve at Annie's Place um, is largely Hispanic and African-American. And what we see is that there actually is a lot of hesitancy in those cultures to put children in child care because it hasn't always been the highest quality child care. And so it's gotten, we, there's a lot of trust barriers that we're yeah. overcoming as well of saying, you know, this is not, what we need is not more child cares that are just kind of throw kids in a room and let them be. What right. we need is high quality early education. Because what's happening now is that kindergarten, it used to be kids went into kindergarten with no school. Now, if you go into kindergarten and you haven't gone to preschool, you're 
already behind when you're starting. Isn't that and insane? Yes. I mean, it is, it's a lot. It's a lot that they're expected to learn by the time they get there. Mm. Um, we come back, please. I, will. I always enjoy talking to you again, Natalie Boyle, mommies in need.org. Uh, it's a great organization. You stay well and look forward to talking to you soon. Okay, Natalie. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, Bye-bye now. Um, just a fantastic organization. Uh, we're going to get to Nikki and Mark in a second, but first a word from our good friends at Moskowitz LLP. I haven't filed a tax return in years. What should I do? Not filing a tax return for years isn't a surprisingly common problem. And the number one reason people don't file is just because they didn't have the money in year one, and then year two runs around, and then they say, well, how can I file year two if they didn't file year one and they still don't have the money? And then it becomes a lifestyle, a criminal-like lifestyle. The other reason is somebody depended on somebody, a spouse, a business partner, they're gone, they don't know what to do. The bottom line is we can get all of the records that the IRS and the state has on you. We'll file all the returns that you need to file, no matter how many years it is. And then if you're the typical person and you just don't have the money to pay the taxes, that's okay. There's all kinds of good options for you. In almost all cases, we do everything for you. You don't have to talk to the government, deal with them, have anything to do with them. And don't stick your head in the sand because the IRS is hiring 87,000 new IRS agents and you don't want them knocking on your door. This is not legal advice and you should consult with your tax attorney or professional. I know that voice. I think that might have been Nikki Maduro, whose show kicks off at uh, noon today. Hi, Nick. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm uh, I'm losing my voice a little bit. I, uh, who else has a damn cold right now? Because everybody around me has a cold. I'm living in my house with my <laughs> wife, who has COVID. Oh, and I know that knock sucks. On wood. I know, and she um she's she's still testing positive after eight days, um, <sighs> and can't taste or smell at all. Oh no. Yeah. I don't know how long, but I, you know, we still wear masks and we, you know, we're mm -hmm. in the same house and my son and I, who lives with, and still lives with us. Like, that's a whole other story. And, uh, but trying to figure out like, you know, uh, when it's safe and they, you know, they send people back to work now after five days. Oh yeah. I just put a mask on. Yeah. I mean, it's so I'll, I'll, I have a story that I'm going to tell during my show, but I'll give you a sneak peek. So I went out with my daughter, got her nails done. And I'm sitting across from this lady and I'm wearing a mask. And, you know, my daughter, because she's having health issues, she should be asked to wear a mask all the time. And so we're wearing a mask and she's just sniffling. And I know these things happen. I know it's cold and flu season, but part of me is like, why the hell aren't you at home? But you can't stay home with every sniffle. But I'm loving my mask, man. It is coming back. I am I'm loving it because yeah. I'm done. I have the worst chest cold right now. It sucks. Did you get the flu but shot? I haven't gotten the flu shot yet. And get off so me. Get way. off of me. I, so I'm way. getting my booster. I already have my booster appointment. So that's good. I know. You always get on me about the flu shot. I, the flu well, is I the least of my worries right now. But I know, but it's a vaccine and it keeps I know, and I have nothing against it. Sick. I'm a busy woman, Chip Franklin. You are a very right. busy woman. You got I loved your last interview. She was really interesting. That was a good Natalie interview. Natalie Boyle. I ran into yeah. her. I, I, I do a show for Steve Moskowitz, a podcast, and we yeah. had her on. And I just love her. I mean, she's tough. She's a cancer survivor, fighter. And yeah. she's fighting for, you know, this, uh, for child care, you know. And, and it's... I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people on the right that they'll say stuff like, you know, like they won't use the word, but, you know, those black people and they're having too many kids and why should I have to pay for, you know, all that kind of crap. But I mean, I, there is something. But that, they're you know, pro-life, right? I mean, they're totally pro-life. Yeah, exactly right, yeah. But anyway, so what do you got going on today? So we're going to talk uh, traffic, uh, Thanksgiving traffic nightmares. Um, I have a couple of stories from people that uh, I know. We'll be talking a little bit about, you know, it's bad for Trump when even Ben Shapiro is calling him out. Right. I mean, it's it. it and I'm so loving the apathy about his announcement and and all of that so we'll get a little into politics i'll talk a little bit about the covid vaccine and everybody urging people to get vaccinated against the flu as well so it's going to be a full show my friend well, you saw this fuentes thing here but right? i would say that the jews had better start being nice to people like us wow 
Yeah, he also believes that women should be burned alive. So Nick Puentes can kiss my <laughs> behind. So. You gotta admire the consistency, I guess. Oh, yeah, so. I guess, you know, he's an ass. Uh, anyway. <laughs> All right, I don't know what happened to Mark, but Mark's show's kicking off in just a few Oh, yeah. Minutes. Hopefully he's not having any technical difficulties, but slide on over there. So yeah, I'll see you later. Slide on over there. And then Nikki at uh, noon to two today. Exactly. And uh, get your shot, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, <laughs> I right. will just for you. All right, baby. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Again, the one and only Nikki Maduro. Um, again, thanks again to Steve Moskowitz and his incredible uh, firm and great people. If you ever have a tax question, they're the people. It's 800 tax deal. I mean, any kind of tax question. I mean, why? I mean, you, how, how much money are you leaving on the table? Because you don't know all the deductions you might have. I've learned a lot and I've done it for a long time. So great people. Um, you can uh, buy every day at nine o'clock here. Please subscribe if you got a chance to watch us at all today and tell your friends to subscribe to my channel. You can go to whatthefranklin.com. It'll take you right there. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Chip Franklin um, or, you know, you can just watch and just have some fun. You'd be well. We'll see you tomorrow on the Tuesday show. We're going to talk about climate change. I got a guy from OSHA who's going to blow you away. I'm not kidding. You got to check it out. We'll see you. <laughs> We shall overcome. Yes, we can. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. What the fuck is wrong with you?